Okay, there we go. Thank you very much for taking the time to fill that out. Uh, John, I will now hand over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Manuel. Uh, yeah, my name is Jay Holmgren. I am the president of Zebra Capital, and I have the honor and privilege of introducing my friend and colleague, uh, Roger Ibbotson, who will be doing the talk on popularity. I'd first like to thank Manuel and for all the organizers of the Global Pensions uh, Program. You know, we're very happy to be here, and we appreciate the uh, appreciate the effort. My light just went off in the office here. The um, uh, one of the things Roger's bio is in the program. I just uh, um, recommend that you take a look at his bio and see where he's coming from. But I do want to highlight three pieces of Roger's research that I think are especially um, applicable. Uh, for the audience and for you know setting up for Roger's talk. Uh, the first is a seminal uh, stocks, bonds, bills, and inflation, uh, which really looks at the relationship of risk and return over the long term, especially and particularly between asset classes. So stocks are riskier than bonds and have had a better return than bonds over the long term. So when planning a pension and looking at that, that's all part of putting that all together. Uh, the other uh, research piece is a monograph, which is called Lifetime Financial Advice, uh, which really looks at that whole concept of life cycle investing. And that is really an important piece, not only for an individual, uh, but for a pension fund or pension plan in structuring and uh, putting things together. Uh, the last piece of research before uh, Roger kicks off is looking at uh, a award-winning paper from a few years ago, which is called uh, Liquidity as an Investment Style, which really lays the groundwork for this whole concept of popularity. And what Roger's really gonna be talking about with the popular, pop, that popularity asset pricing model, uh, which really is an enhancement uh, to CAPM. Uh, those papers are all available, I believe from the CFA Society, Roger, I think they can get everything there. So it's available via the CFA. And so if you have any of those, uh, we'll have, we'd like to receive those, uh, go to the CFA and you can pick those, uh, pick those up there. Uh, yes, so that's with right. that, let me turn it over to Roger. And Roger, take it away. Thank you, uh, gracias. <laughs> Actually, uh, so uh, I buenos dias in Latin America, e buenas tardes in Europa, e quizás uh, en otra parte del mundo, um, buenas noches. Uh, por supuesto, uh, uh, hablo en, es en inglés hoy. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to obviously, yes, I'm going to, I have to speak in English. And I'm going to have to share the screen here first, I think. Uh, let's see. I'm going to close this. So I think I have the, the screen. Do I have the screen here? Um, I'm going to try sharing the screen. And I think I've done it. Uh, just uh, so uh, somebody should just confirm that we can see the screen. Good. Okay, so this is the talk: popularity, pricing, and premiums. And and uh, you can see, of course, I've, I've J Jay didn't mention, but John Holmgren did not mention. But I'm also a professor at Yale now, emeritus professor. And uh, and and some of this stuff actually comes from Ibbotson Associates, where I was. Uh, uh, I actually founded that company decades ago, and it's a company that I sold to Morningstar. Uh, but here I'm actually in capacity as chairman of Zebra Capital. So I, I'm really just excited about this topic, popularity, pricing, and premiums, and I'll tell you why. Second here. All right, so uh, it was mentioned there, one way you can get uh, some background on this is is a monograph from the CFA Institute, which actually is just downloadable from their site. You're looking at the paper copies, but you can download the download this popularity, a bridge between classical and behavioral finance. And my co-authors there are listed. Uh, they're actually from Morningstar, Tom Itzorek, uh, Paul Kaplan, and James Shong. So uh, a lot of what I talk about today would be based on that, on this, and some other papers that I've written. 
So let's start with the capital asset pricing model. It's actually a, a wonderful model. It's um, it, we can see that the expected return is really the sum of a, the risk free rate plus a beta times a market risk premium. I mean, this is really very nice. It's only three inputs here. And the risk, risk free rate, you can look up the asset beta. I mean, we can have various ways of calculating betas, but but uh, it's not that controversy, uh, big, big controversy. The only really part that we would have a lot of controversy about is what is the equity market risk premium here. Um, uh, we can measure it from lots of different ways or approach it different ways. But uh, ultimately, this is a very simple model. It actually tells you what the expected return of an asset is. It has only these three inputs. It was actually developed way back by um, a Bill Sharp and John Lintner back in the 1960s. And, and, and Sharp won a Nobel Prize, I guess, similar to we have, we, I, my form, the speaker before me, Bob Burton, of course, has a Nobel Prize too. So, so uh, a lot of the great works in finance uh, actually have achieved uh, Nobel Prizes. This um, in, the, in the CAPM, there's only one kind of risk aversion involved here, one dimension to it. And so the real key assumptions underlying the CAPM is that you have the um, one, one dimension of risk aversion and homogeneous expectations. And everybody has the same view of the world. And uh, the question now is, can we generalize this to include other risk and non-risk preferences? Can we, can we have a, a model perhaps that uh, has a be better applica applicability? And uh, so in the CAPM, it, it is simple. Um, you can see it, how it works is if you have uh, more risk, what you're doing is you're lowering the valuation and you're raising the expected return. So you think of a set of cash flows that you expect to get. If you expect to get a certain set of cash flows, if you, as you saw in that formula, if you raise the expected return, you're lowering the valuation. And that's why it's a, it's a pricing model because it, and it connects the valuation to the expected returns with the discount rate. And in the cap M, there's only one kind of risk, but uh, this has been extended to other kinds of risks. But, but um, all, the, all these extensions are only in the risk world. Now, I, I've been interested in the risk world for a long time, and I actually, uh, Jay uh, Holmgren, I call him Jay, by the way, he's, he, John Holmgren, Jay Holmgren, he can be called either way, but, uh, but I can't help but calling him Jay. So uh, Jay uh, has uh, had mentioned this SB, SBBI here, where we look at the long-term returns of stocks, bonds, bills, and inflation. And this blue series here, dark blue one, started with a dollar and at the end of 1925, going through the depression and reinvesting all the dividends. And that dollar actually grows to a phenomenal uh, $9,245 over this 90, uh, 95 year period, uh, 94 year period. So that's at a 10.2%. So there's actually tremendous uh, compounding exponential growth here that actually goes on. And, and um, the reason why I put this data together had to do with risk because uh, this difference between, between uh, the stock market and say government bonds is, or, or treasury bills is, a, is an equity risk premium. This difference between a, a longer bond and a, and a treasury bill is a horizon or an interest rate risk premium. And there's even a small cap premium here. So you could actually even have higher returns. Now, if you wanted to put everything in, in um, real terms after inflation, just divide everything by 14. So that 9,245 is actually uh, about 660, but still 660 times your money over a long 95 year lifetime is just an incredible amount of wealth that has been created in the stock market and, and uh, potentially even higher returns with small caps, as you can see. So, so this is all about risk and return and risk and return really seems to explain a lot about asset classes. Um, by the way, everything here is shown on a log scale here. It has to be shown on a log scale. In a log scale, uh, a, a return 
when you have uh, say nine thousand dollars and when you have one dollar shows up at the same slope essentially. So that's the great reason why any longer term uh, ex um, demonstration of everything you have to put on a, lo a log scale. All right, so let's uh, let, let let's consider this 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 told us so much about risk and return and the, and the payoffs across asset classes. Um, so can we generalize the cap M and what are its limitations? Well, first of all, it only includes one kind of risk. And I just showed you the stocks, bonds, bills, and inflation that we actually could look at more kinds of risks. We could look at interest rate risk. We could look at, we could look at uh, um, default risk and so forth. We can look at all, or we can look at small, the risk of small cap stocks and so forth. So we could look at different types of risk. So we could include that. It also does not include some non-risk preferences. We care a lot about things. Uh, the one that immediately comes to mind is liquidity, um, where you really like liquidity. You have a preference for liquidity. You have a preference to avoid risk. Uh, but there are a lot of other preferences you can see that well, that might be important, and we're going to talk about those. The real limitation is not just so that we don't include these risk preferences that we'll see in a second here that, unfortunately, as great as the and simple as and practical as the capital asset pricing model is, it's not very well empirically justified on its own. Here, for example, here's a study I did where I looked across, and this is the US market, where I looked across uh, over a 20 year period uh, with different metrics. So we take a metric, say like size, and put the Put the all the stocks in the universe. In this case, it was roughly the Russell 3000 universe. Put all the stocks in the universe and um, rank them by size into quartiles, and we show the four quartiles. So if you look at the green ones here, these are the size quartiles and so forth, and and they're color coded here. And there's actually 21 different metrics I have here in these in these categories. And so given that they're all a, with a metric, we're, we're ranking across the metric and we're putting the stocks in one of four portfolios, there are now 44 portfolios here. So there are 44 uh, results here, 44 portfolio returns on this axis, showing the arithmetic return, showing the standard deviation over, over this 20 year period. Now, if the capital asset pricing model or the model that explained what's going on, it would be Essentially, here's the market portfolio. Here's the riskless rate. It would be um, actually the capital asset pricing model is beta, but it's almost the same thing. The the uh, it, things should go along this line, but in fact, if if we put a regression, which I did here, uh, the the actual line is this is actually the opposite direction of what we should get here. So so uh, the we can see an empirical limitation of the capital asset pricing model. Now, we did go work across asset classes, and let me show you another uh, another example here. This is actually from uh, a lot of you are familiar with the Dimson, Marsh, and Stanton data, where they look at uh, um, 19 countries across uh, um, now more than a more than a century of data. They started in 1901, and here I plotted through 2017. Well. Each of these dots is one of these countries, and, and the blue ones here are the treasury bill rates returns. And they're all in their local currencies, and the and the green squares here are the bond returns, and the blue triangles are the um, stock returns. Well, you can see that stocks do better than oh, in almost every country, stocks outperform bonds, and bonds outperform treasury bills. However, when you look across these countries, uh, we see something pretty different here because it turns out that the low risk countries actually have, these are, have higher returns. They have higher stock returns, they have higher bond returns, and they have higher treasury bill returns in, in, in their local currencies. So, so this is, a, in one sense, it, it supports the capital asset pricing model. It supports the capital asset pricing model in, across the asset classes in the sense that stocks do better than bonds and bonds do better than bills, but it actually is not supportive across these countries in the sense that low risk countries do better than high risk countries 
whether we're talking about stocks, bonds, or bills. So, um, so we can see that our risk and return aligned across countries as the, as the cap man proposes. It's pretty simply clear that the answer is no to that one. Now we can look, and, and I'll look at it and, uh, here. These are the three largest capital markets where, where I just took the last uh, 20 years of data here for the US market. I already showed you this graph in a bigger form, but here's Japan with 20 years of data looking across all those metrics. So in each case, there's 84, 84 portfolios here um, by various split up by rankings like size or value or, or beta or things like that. And, and, um, and also here's the UK. Well, we can see that the dark blue lines here, that would be the cap M lines. The cap M lines, uh, um, unfortunately, do not explain very well what's going on empirically here. Um, we're not going to discard the cap M. It's actually, it's just, we just view it as an oversimplification here. What's missing, we need some broad universal concept that's going to explain everything. Something I hope that is simple enough that everybody can understand. I mean, we just had a, a talk by, um, by Professor Merton who, who made retirement simple, even though it was complicated. And he tried to talk to regular people by talking about income and, and things like that. Well, here we're trying to come up with a model that all of us can understand. And, and uh, we, we in, in our papers, we come up with the mathematics of it, but I think the concepts are really, really simple here. So you want some universal model, you want it to affect pricing, and it should include other preferences that we really care about. And I'll show you what those are. So what is the PAPM, the popularity asset pricing model? Well, it's based on a couple of papers that we, I, the first one was actually in 2014 that I co-authored and then another later paper and then that monograph that I showed and I'm working on another couple of papers now on the topic um, where we put in the multiple risk preferences and some non-risk preferences. O other things besides risk, like, like liquidity, for example. Liquidity sometimes has been thought of as a risk, but I don't primarily think of it as a risk. But also even behavioral things like brands or ESG and so forth, things that we care about that might not uh, fall into the category of risk. And a, a model like the PAPM, uh, we actually can put in heterogeneous expectations, which allows for mispricing. In other words, if we have different opinions about what's going to happen, no longer the same opinion about everything, then, then we can have um, some people can be wrong and some people can be right, and you can have different skills in the market and so forth. So our model is general that it include that as well. So even though it's a very general model, it, it, the concept is really simple. Popularity is how much we like something, just what it sounds like. I guess in Spanish should be popularity dot, you know, but it's basically how much you like, how much you like something and how much you like it, how much you tend to like and you pre prefer something. Um, sometimes it's just how much you recognize something, but ultimately it's how much you demand of something. So if you think of a set of cash flows, if we like that, uh, if it comes in a form that we like, we'll pay more for it and it will be popular. And if something is popular, then if an asset is popular, it's going to have a higher valuation and a lower expected return. If it's unpopular, it's going to have a lower valuation but higher expected return. So now we can think of lots of things that might be popular or unpopular. And ultimately a model like this can explain premiums, the anomalies that you, we often talk about in the market and mispricing. So, um, it, and of course we don't have to confine ourselves to the classical world. We can also move to the behavioral world. So just to give you some idea of what we're uh, really talking about here. Um, I, I mentioned the equity risk premium and in the capital asset pricing model, the basically stocks are riskier than safe, safe assets. Risk is unpopular. The capital asset pricing model is all about popularity, but it only talks about one thing that's popular. That is risk. It's, risk is unpopular. 
And if risk is unpopular, it's going to be priced. But of course, even in classical finance, you're going to have something like liquidity, which is very popular. If it's popular, it's going to have a high price, higher price. But that means it's going to have a lower expected return for a given set of cash flows. Other kinds of risk, like uh, severe downside risk, um, we may especially dislike severe downside risk. And the evidence is that at least historical severe downside risk um, um, is stocks actually, those stocks do better if they've had a, a, something bad happen to them in the past. And size, well, size actually falls into a couple of classical categories because actually small caps are riskier. But they're also, I, I, even a stronger effect, they're less liquid. They have less capacity. So these are all reasons why we don't, even in classical finance, we don't like any of these things. They, anything, if we like or don't like it, we don't like less liquidity. We like more liquidity. We don't like, um, we don't like small caps because they're hard to buy and they're riskier and less liquid and so forth. But in behavioral finance, we can start disliking other things like value. If we find value stocks less glamorous and and uh, uh, things like that, we may actually. I, so I think a bit value is much more behavioral. It's been posited perhaps more in a classical framework, but I think of it as primarily something that if people don't systematically don't like it, it might have a premium. Um, when you get to something like low volatility, low beta, the fact that uh, we have explanations for that, th that for example that active managers prefer, prefer high beta stocks in the hopes of outperforming benchmarks. So if you ever, if they all want those high beta stocks and they, and they have leverage aversion, then, then it turns out that those high beta stocks, they like them too much. And that means they end up with lower returns and higher prices, which clearly would violate the capital asset pricing model. Other things you might not like, or you like, well, one thing that a lot of people like is ESG and well, it's changing and well, we like it more and more and more, the prices are going up. But once we like them a lot, uh, once they reach a level of liking them, that means we have to pay more for them. It means their long run expected returns are lower. And the uh, last thing here is brand and reputation. That's purely behavioral, but basically I'll show you an example. In fact, that people tend to like the brands. Okay, so, so uh, in classical finance, the key to classical finance is rationality. Uh, investors maximize cash flows. They want high, higher cash flows. They want higher expected returns. But they also want other things like liquidity or tax efficiency, and they want less risk. That's typically what we care about in, in classical finance. The key thing being we're rational about these things. These are rational to care about. In the model that we're, uh, most models of of uh, classical finance either assume arbitrage or equilibrium. And we're talking about equilibrium here. So our CAPM, the CAPM is about equilibrium too, because it says uh, if, if risk is a preference, it's equilibrium. Uh, things like option pricing and things like that, that's going to be more arbit arbitrage because it's pricing one thing relative to another. But uh, in the market uh, across, the, uh, if you really want to price things according to people's preferences, it's an equilibrium framework. And I'm going to show you what, why arbitrage isn't going to remove these preferences in a second here. So efficient markets is another concept of, of classical finance that security prices reflect all available information regarding their value, that the prices are fair. Uh, we'll see in, PAP, in the PAPM, uh, we can have inefficient prices that's possible too when we start going into uh, uh, behavioral finance and mispricing and so forth. All right, so uh, here's an example of, of uh, say, let's say you have a preference for something, can it be arbitraged away? And these are uh, actually two boxes of aspirin. They're identical actually what's inside, but they both have the same dose, 325 milligrams. They both have 100 tablets. Um, but one's a generic, and in the US, you can buy these CVS aspirin for $1.14. Bayer, which of course is actually a German company, um, but, but um, they're sold in the US, and you can probably buy these in other places. The uh, Bayer was the original developer of aspirin ages ago, 
But uh, you can see that uh, even though the identical good is uh, it's the same, they're in different boxes, but the, what's in the boxes is the same. It's just a generic formula. That's the patents have gone away a long time ago. Well, actually, what actually happens though is that uh, people buy both of these things. If you ask what's the average price of aspirin, it's going to be some combination and it weighted average somewhere between these two. It, it's not the fact that, that the CVS aspirin, the generic aspirin, can be arbitraged away. It's very hard to arbitrage this in the goods market. It's also hard to arbitrage between stocks and so forth. If people have a preference for something, it's not going to get removed here. So it generally cannot be arbitraged away. Um, it's very difficult to arbitrage away. It's not so difficult to arbitrage um, a stock and an option together. Things that are a derivative product, and you can also you can arbitrage pretty carefully. But but across stock markets, uh, it's very difficult to actually do uh, much arbitrage. So okay, a PAPM in the classical world now includes bundles of characteristics that we like or don't like. So think of corporations as supplying some cash flows here in some securitized form. And investors are demanding these uh, things. They, they have preferences for these. Um, if, they, if the cash flows come in a more liquid form, they're going to pay more for them. If they're less liquid form, they're going to pay less and the, and the valuation will go down. If the cash flows come in a more taxable form, they're going to be more, they're going to be less valuable. If they come in a risky form, they'll be less valuable. These types of things are unpopular. They make them less valuable. But whatever happens to the uh, to the valuation, the opposite thing is going to happen to the expected return. So um, our, now the model is going to include other kinds of classical preferences. But we can we'll, we'll see in a moment though. It also can include behavioral preferences. So. Here, here, here's how it actually, you can see it graphically. And we have many illustrations of this kind of thing because we, have, we uh, can have many securities or many investors. In this example, there's three investors and five securities, A, B, C, D, E. And in the, in the cap M, everybody has the same view of these five, invest, five securities, A, B, C, D, E. And you get an efficient frontier and the tangency portfolio, everybody wants that tangency portfolio because it, when combined with the riskless rate, it actually um, gives you the highest slope decline here. So the investors one and two are, have some cash mixed that went in with it. Investor three has some um, leverage it up, but everybody's essentially buying combinations of the market portfolio. So since everybody wants the same portfolio, it becomes the market portfolio and it prices all assets and, and the market portfolio is the efficient portfolio. When you go to the PAPM now and add some other preferences, I guess just think of it as maybe one other preference like liquidity, uh, more liquid assets will be more valuable and have lower expected returns and, more, and less liquid assets will be less valuable and have higher expected returns. So let's say you, you add that in, the most, a, I've now ranked these five assets in terms of popularity, A, B, C, D, E. And the most popular asset now, A, the expected return is dropping because it has, it's so popular, you're going to pay more for it. It'll have, a, for the same cash flows, it'll have a lower expected return. E is the least popular and the expected return is rising. And all, all these uh, securities uh, in, in that order, D, D went up and B went down and so forth. But uh, ultimately now we get, an, we, we can have an, a, a frontier of all these assets here, uh, but it turns out now, because now in this example, investors one and two have a preference for something. They, they be, maybe they want liquidity. They want a lot of extra liquidity. They're buying more of A and B because they like those, even though they're having lower expected returns. E isn't doing that. You can think of E maybe as the arbitrager here. E is levering up and, and saying, well, these, um, E saying, I'm sorry, investor three is, no, says that E is a 
more attractively priced security. I'm going to buy more of that one. And so investor three loads up on E and may even short uh, um, A, uh, A and B. But the point of this thing is we still get an equilibrium and ultimately we get a market portfolio, but the market portfolio is no longer the tangency, tangency portfolio and the only investor three buys the tangency portfolio because investor three doesn't have those extra preferences. Okay, so now we have a model that can include I just um, as many preferences as you like. And think of this model now just to give you the summation of how it works. In terms of expectations, the cap M is just homogeneous. The PAP M can be heterogeneous or homogeneous. It could be either way. Um, in both cases, you can borrow or lend at the riskless rate. In the cap M, you're just averse to risk. In the PAP M, you're averse to risk, but you could be averse to other things that aren't risk related. Um, or you might like something. If you like or dislike something about a security, it's going to go in here, apart from the cash flows we're talking about. And then things like taxes and transaction costs, those get ignored in the cap M, but now these are actually part of the characteristics that you might like or dislike. And then you have the, um, the um, market portfolio. Well, um, in the cap M, you just maximize the sharp ratio, but in the PAP M, it's not efficient. What are you holding then? You're holding um, in the cap M, everybody holds the market portfolio, but here you have to make your own optimization because you have to take into account your own preferences. These are more custom made portfolios. And, and then the expected returns, um, they're related to the beta um, in the cap M, but here it could be a linear function of lots of things, um, different loadings, different characteristics of different securities. So, so in behavioral finance, uh, the um, in contrast to classical finance, uh, we can question now the basic assumption of rationality. We don't have to be rational with behavioral finance. We allow for irrational behavior. And once you allow for irrational behavior, you can have biases come in and these biases can impact asset pricing. And you have lots of distortions you get like uh, loss aversion, overconfidence, framing, anchoring, whatever, um, all, all these kind of distortions. So, and I, I already showed you that if some of the people have these distortions, uh, they don't necessarily get arbitraged away because, because they're aggregated across all the demand curves. So if some, some of us have, have uh, some uh, preference for something and others don't. I right? take the simplest one, liquidity, even before you get to behavioral finance. In liquidity, if some of us want liquidity and some of us don't care, some of us have long horizons and aren't don't care about liquidity, just because some of us want the liquidity, it's going to get actually in the in the price. And the same thing if some of us want uh, a brand or something like that, it's going to be in the price in behavioral finance. And 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 we can actually have some mispricing if some of us uh, have distortions in our views is going to be in the price. Uh, just to give you a concrete example, overconfidence, for example. I often ask my class, how many of you in the classroom think you are a better than average driver of a car, of an automobile? Well, almost everybody in my class says they think they are, they're better than average. And, and, uh, any group I've ever talked to, I mean, everybody always says they're better than average. Uh, but of course, we know across all people, um, the average has to be the average. And we can't only, roughly only half of us can be better than average. We can't all be better than average. Well, that's one of the distortions that people have. Everybody, most people think they're better than average. If I were, I, I'm not going to ask for a vote here in this, in this, we could have a voting here in the, in the big conference here. But I could ask you, how many of you think you're a better than average investor? You know, probably most of you think you're a better than average investor. But it, but but not all of us really are better than average, and that's one of the uh, one of one of the things that actually can cause distortions in the market. Okay, so how, how does this line up? Well, in classical finance, I guess uh, we can we can think of as risk. Risk is uh, is uh, 
in the capital asset price model, that's all we care about risk and of course the cash flows and how it translated in the expected returns. But also in classical finance, you can add other kinds of uh, market frictions like taxes, liquidity, trading costs, and so forth. So all these things could be classical. The key is in classical finance that they're rational. It's certainly rational to need liquidity for many of us. When you start moving into behavioral finance, we, we just have, have emotional responses to things. And uh, apart from whatever cash flows a, a, a stock might produce, we might have, uh, we might just say, well, I recognize that company. I never heard of that company. So I'm going to buy the companies that I recognize, not the companies that I never heard of. So that sort of thing is going to get in, into the price. The, the other thing we'll do is we make cognitive errors in behavioral finance. And, and um, everybody's heard of Palm Pilot, those kind of uh, errors. But more recently, for example, we're on a Zoom call right now, actually. And, and back in March, there's a there's a, a company in China that has the ticker ticker code um, Z O O M. Meanwhile, the uh, Zoom that we're on, the company that actually produces this is Z M. Well, people got confused back in March and April. That actually delisted uh, because uh, people were uh, suspend trading in it because people were getting confused between the two Zooms but only one of them is the kind of call we're at. So those kind of errors occur from time to time and uh, they can cause distortions in the prices. That would be mispricing, of course. So you can have mispricing in, in a PAPM though, because if you have a preference for something, even if it's an incorrect preference, it's going to get into the model. So now in the uh, PAPM with, with behavioral, allowing for both irrational and irrational Preferences. I put all the rational ones here in this bucket, but we can have all these other kinds of uh, behavioral activities. And, and I know that Diego talked yesterday about the summing up all kinds of behavioral things. Those kind of things could be here. They can either be things we like, which will raise the valuation, or things we dislike. But that whole bundle of things, whatever, all the kind of things we've been talking about in this conference, uh, that others have talked about in this conference, can essentially raise or lower the valuation. The more we like it, it'll raise the valuation. The more we dislike it, it'll lower the valuation. But whatever happens to the valuation, given a set of expected cash flows, it's going to it's going to uh, raise the raise or lower the expected return. It'll be exactly offset. Okay, so I guess putting it all together here, the thing about popularity is it's really an umbrella model that really includes everything. But it, but it sets our framework right so that we actually can focus on what really matters here, what we like and what we don't like across assets. And, and, uh, and in the classical world, we have the CAPM and efficient markets and new equilibrium theory, something that I've developed years ago. But these, these uh, popularity, these are all classical They're, and things get priced in the classical world, but they also get priced in the behavioral world. All these kinds of behavioral things get priced in a popularity framework because it has to do with what we like and what we don't like. And, and it, even if only some of us like something and some of us are indifferent, it, it can have a net effect on the market. And so this gives you a whole new way of thinking about, uh, about how things are priced in the marketplace. Not just one thing like risk in, in the capital, uh, capital asset pricing model. Now, uh, I, I'll show you uh, how, how could we test this. Um, so we've already shown that popularity is consistent with the premiums found in classical finance, as well as behavioral premiums in this pricing. It's something that could potentially explain everything. It's something that, by the way, to be, to fit in, it should have something that uh, really is, um, we have a strong preference for if it's going to be a premium. Something that won't go away once, as soon as you learn about it, um, like brands or ESG or, or, or um, 
of liquidity or, or risk are things that don't go away even if you even if you know that the premium's there you're willing to pay for that premium um, so let's look at something that pop popularity might test that isn't in the standard set of classical or behavioral stuff that you haven't seen before so that we've looked at a couple of things here uh, in in the monograph that i showed you uh, one of them is branding i'm going to show you branding and i'm going to show you moats just a couple of preliminary results to give you an idea how this how you could test this so um, interbrand actually produces uh, uh, top 100 brands every year and and they value the brands like in 2014, Apple was the highest valued brand and they rank them, rank the brands. And so we just said, let's take a portfolio with the quartile of the highest brands and compare it with the quartile of the lowest brands. Now, the, this is a little counterintuitive, of course, everything about PAPM is counterintuitive. We're saying that we might expect the ones that were the high brands to have get people too excited about and actually potentially have lower returns of higher brands. So let's see what actually happened here. Here is the, um, it turns out that the high brands are in red. These are the quartile with the highest brands. These are the quartile with the lowest brands. Um, over this period anyway, um, low, low brands beat high brands um, with uh, about the same risk and a clearly higher sharp ratio. I will say, if you put in the post COVID data in here and all that, it's not necessarily gonna, it's gonna mitigate. This is all gonna be quite as true with the most recent data. Um, here's, here's another one. What um, moats are very, been talked a lot about, like Warren Buffett has talked about moats and and my co-authors there at Morningstar and they, they at Morningstar, they've talked a lot about moats. The idea is that a company that has a big moat, it, it's, it, a uh, moat is basically it can protect its profits and so forth. And so it's got an efficient scale. It's got cost advantages, it's got intangible assets. All these things make it very hard to penetrate. It's like a castle moat. That's what where the moat comes from. A castle moat, it's hard to penetrate the pro profitability of this company. And the argument would be that companies that have these big moats should have higher returns. But what if, uh, we like these companies with big moats too much, then they might potentially have lower returns. So let's see what actually happened here. And, and Morty Sarah, I gotta say, was pretty surprised with this because they were promoting moats. But it turned out that the highest moats actually did worse of, um, than the lowest moats uh, in terms of returns anyway. Actually, they had higher risk. So it's sort of a mixed evidence here. Uh, um, so, but, uh, uh, it's uh, these are the kind of things you can look for here in and other ways of, I'll give you one other way we would generally test this um, so one of the problems in general in in trying to test uh, asset pricing models is we usually test them with the realized returns we look at a lot of historical data and we look at the realized returns and the problem with, with a realized return, though, of a stock, it has three parts. It has the expected return. It actually has any changes in preferences, like, you know, like ESG. If you're liking something more and more and more all the time, it, it's going to raise the price over your period that you're measuring. And it's also going to have any expected changes in growth. So that certain companies, if we have dramatic uh, supply effects going on here, if companies... I mean, this one actually dominates a lot because uh, we don't, our expectations are often incorrect. We can't really know which ones are going to uh, grow faster or slower and so forth. So the problem is pulling out these expected returns. It's really noisy. And that, that's what's being argued, for example, about value. Why doesn't value work now? And they say, well, it hasn't worked for the last 10 years. Well, the argument that it does work still is it's so noisy Yes, it works on average, but you can't see the average when when uh, you have so many other things going on with those value companies. Another way to approach this, and actually we're working on this right now, some empirical work with my co-authors, is if you really want to measure what's, I got to back up here. 
if you, if you really want to measure what's going on uh, with popularity, why don't you do an event, event study where you say, well, what if something changed? Like you have a split. If company companies jump upon the announcement of a split, or if they, or if the company joins the S and P 500 index or something like that, that makes them more popular. That makes them more liquid. These kinds of things happen though instantaneously. We don't have to measure them over a long period of time. So, if popularity is a is a something that really explains pricing, we can actually see it in these event studies, not just in the realized returns. So it's a whole nother way of approaching it, but uh, it shows the potential here. Okay, I'm going to conclude here now um, that what have we what have we done here? Um, uh, PAPM is the generalization of the CAPM. We're not throwing out the CAPM. We're basically now allowing for multiple preferences for risk and non-risk. We're allowing for the world to be classical or behavioral. We're allowing it to have premiums, things that are there for a long time, even if you sort of know they're there, but we're also allowing it to be have some mispricing. If they're short-term, if things we only like right now, a fad or something, then it's can cause mispricing. Um, that, that security uh, expected returns, the really, um, and prices are just the weighted average of everybody's expectation. So we're all in it together. There's no infra marginal investor. We're all on the margin. We're collectively setting the price. It's weighted by our wealth, our risk aversion, our preferences, and maybe the strength of our opinions as well. And those sort of things built, get built into the price. So popularity in the end, uh, it, it's a method here that, that provides a bridge. That's why I have a bridge here between classical and behavioral finance and with the potential for even having inefficient capital markets in, the, in this framework. So I'll, I'll end here. I think I'm pretty much on schedule and uh, I'll, turn, I'll look at, Turn it over here for questions. Hey, Roger. Well, thanks. I can um, synthesize some of the questions uh, that relate to um, you know popularity and preferences. Uh, looking at kind of the whole uh, the newer research on smart beta factors, premiums, uh, Fama French three factor kind of models to enhance CAPM. How does that all relate into the uh, PAPM model? Yeah, well, people often ask me that question, so I've actually included a, a slide here in the appendix, just to give you an idea um, that uh, the CAPM, of course, is you can, you can bring back all the kinds of things you've been thinking about anyway. You can incorporate a smart beta framework into this. Uh, basically, these are just some factor models here where you can have the CAPM, you can have the Fama French three factor here. I, I, and that is something that uh, I developed a long time ago where we brought in liquidity and different risk anomalies. Or you can bring in ESG brands, uh, even momentum in some form. So uh, you can, essentially what smart beta lacks without, without the PAPM here, what, what it lacks is a model to go with it. It's basically a, a idea about, um, Shouldn't shouldn't other things be in there other than other than risk, and and uh, the answer is yes. Uh, but um, PAP M gives you a theoretical framework for what it is, and it only says if there's going to be a premium, if it's going to stay there, it's got to be the kind of thing that will would people would like or not like even after they understood that it, it's there. For example, a lot of things disappear once you discover them, a lot of market inefficiencies. But, but risk doesn't disappear once you discover it. Liquidity doesn't disappear once you discover it. Some people are going to really like liquidity even, even after they know they have to pay more for it. And, and branding is the same sort of way, or just companies that are more recognizable. They're going to actually have higher prices and lower returns. And that's not going to go away once we discover it. So. It gives us a framework for thinking about what what kind of things really should go into the smart beta, and one of the things, one of the difficulties in, in, in smart beta is a lot of things worked historically, but once they're discovered, 
uh, they don't really work anymore. You have to carefully select what kind of things here, but popularity really gives you the framework of how to select it too. Right. So like it's another like like related to that though, these are all long-term concepts and they're contrarian concepts. Uh, that that's the key here. Um, in order in order to get a higher valuation, and you can sort of even see it in this little balance beam here, we have to go against the grain here. If everybody wants liquidity, you have to be the provider of liquidity. If you're the provider of the liquidity, you're, you, you're contrary to them. You're going to get the extra return. If everybody's willing to give up some return to get them liquidity, then you have to, by giving and having less liquidity, you can actually have the higher return. If everybody wants the brand, you, you can get move away from the top brand and you can get the higher return. So you, yes, it is definitely a contrarian. And again, it's a formal theory because we, we, I have not shown you the math of this theory here, but it's, it's in that monograph and it's in some of our other papers. And so it's a, it's a formal theory that actually can uh, include all the whatever contrarian things are in there. That's right. But no. yes, contrarian things get priced and we're, set, we're just showing you how. Did you look at multiple asset classes as well in this analysis? M multiple asset prices, well, that was, that goes back to SBVI, of course, where the stocks, bonds, bills, and inflation. And of course, multiple asset classes, the dominant thing for them is risk. But you can consider other things like real estate, for example. Real estate is not so high risk, but it's very illiquid. And so it, 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 it has, so like real estate is an interesting asset class. It has, uh, it's taxed differently. I think we've seen that in the, it's come out in the presidential elections and so forth, you know, but the, the, the real estate is taxed differently. It um, has more favorable tax treatment, but it's very illiquid, has high, high trading costs and so forth. And, but, it, but it's not that risky necessarily. It's not as typical, at least after it's all rented up, it's not, it's not as uh, risky as say the stock market. So, there are different characteristics for these different asset classes, and they each get priced differently according to those characteristics. Like one of the simplest things we might see is in the US, municipal bonds, which are issued by states and local authorities, are tax exempt from federal taxes. And so uh, they end up having lower yields than corporate bonds, which are taxed differently. So the more tax something is, the higher it's the higher its pre-tax yield. And then, and then uh, but, uh, but of course the people have to pay the taxes afterwards. So, so anyway, it, uh, all of this uh, applies across asset classes as well as, as well as within the stock market. Not sure. I think one of, if my Spanish is okay, the, uh, I think one of the questions I think is very interesting is that, you know, th is the PAPM apl applicable in smaller markets that are less liquid and less efficient? Uh, it is, it, it's, a, it's basically applicable to all markets because first of all, it can also include mispricing. And so by mi mispricing is the same, it's like a premium, but it's, it's shorter term. It's something we like a lot. Uh, if we want, it gets overpriced because we like it too much, but if it's very temporary, then that's a mispricing. If it's permanent, then it becomes a premium. That's the distinction between mispricing and a premium. A premium is permanent even after we know it's there. So in the smaller- uh, a, the Mispricing is temporary. Gotcha, so in the smaller, less liquid markets, you're seeking out the less popular premiums. Yeah, well, in a less liquid market, you, first of all, it's less liquid. Often it's, you, you, you will find more mispricing also in, smaller, less liquid markets. Not sure. And then um, how, how do you measure the popularity of a given security? Well, there are a lot of ways. Uh, of course, any of the things I said here back here, and I could go back to a table, th there are lots of measures of popularity because every, everything is being picked up. So uh, all of these are effectively measures of popularity. 
but but I mean, perhaps a more direct way, one of the things we look at at uh, at Zebra Capital actually is uh, how much how how things are traded. If there's a lot of trading activity, people have a lot of interest in the stock. If there's a lot of trading activity, uh, they it tends to be a popular stock and stocks that. Um, and we can measure how it changes over time. And then as the trading activity is less, it uh, becomes less popular. Gotcha. Okay, well, uh, Manuel, I think that's, uh, I think that's time. But we, if anybody has any additional questions or anything else, please feel free to reach out. Uh, very happy for that. I believe the presentation and uh, recording will be available as well. So if you like anything, please feel free to reach out to us. And Roger, uh, thank you very much. I thank everybody here. I'm so, I'm so glad to actually be able to talk in this setting to people all over the world, actually. So, so this has been great. Gracias. Thank you very much for uh, John and, and Roger. Uh, I will, yeah, let, we, we just have time, some few seconds to tell you about the, the next uh, sessions. So a colleague of mine is sharing a screen. There we go. So this is just a reminder that in one hour time, we will have these three sessions for you to pick one and that the link, the Zoom link to connect to each of those is different from the one you, you connected uh, this morning for the keynote sessions. So thanks again. Thank you very much. Thanks for a productive morning and see you later.